So yes, we're going to be talking about security of Kubernetes today. And a lot of these kinds of conversations, at least when I was doing software development, which I did for most of my career, were always kind of a downer. Like I'd come to a conference like this, and I'd learn a bunch of cool, exciting new things that I wanted to go to apply on whatever I was working on. And then I'd have to have a conversation, you know, I'd have a conversation or go to a session about security, and it seemed like it would scare me off from the stuff I was doing or show me all the roadblocks I would have to face. So hopefully I can take a little bit of a different perspective with this and show you that a lot of the stuff you already know about security is applicable. It's a little bit of a different set of building blocks we use to build our security strategy with Kubernetes and containerization. But a lot of the same things that have been working for us for a long time are going to continue to work. Before we get into that, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Hi, I'm Jen, um, and I'm a security advocate at Google. And that means that I spend about half of my time focused on security research. So I spend a lot of time tinkering around with things. I'm usually a little bit more focused on the AppSec side, um, but I'm a little bit of a generalist within security for Cloud Platform. And then I spend another part of my time, almost half, coming to conferences like this and talking to people like you, and hopefully sharing some wisdom that I learned from my own research and from my talented peers at Google so that you can use cloud stuff easier and safer. And I always love hearing from people. So if you ever have any questions, especially if they're related to Cloud Platform, Google Cloud Platform, and security, drop me a line. My DMs are open on Twitter. I'm miming codes on Twitter. Or if you'd like to contact me via some other means, uh, you can find a link on my homepage. I'll probably also have slides for this talk up on that website. If there's Wi-Fi on the airplane, it'll be up sometime this afternoon. So before we get into the actual content, let's, let's spend a little time on story time. Because everyone likes stories, right? Story's a little bit scary. But I want to establish that security in containers is something we do need to care about. And fortunately, there's not a shortage of stories for me to pull from here. Um, but one of my favorites is from earlier, earlier this year, in February, Tesla was experimenting with Kubernetes. And that's really cool. They were deploying their own cluster on AWS, but they ran into some, some minor problems. They had somebody hack in and mine some cryptocurrency. Specifically, they were mining Monero. And it's been a few months, and there's been some great write-ups on the events that happened. So now we know exactly what led up to this event. We know about the, the kill chain the hackers used. And here it is in brief. They deployed a Kubernetes cluster, and they turned on the Kubernetes dashboard, which is really cool. It has all sorts of pretty charts on it and stuff. Uh, it also is a pretty privileged piece of software. And they did not have any other mitigation strategies in place to prevent someone from accessing. Essentially, it was up, exposed to the internet with no password or anything like that. And somebody found it probably just blindly scanning for like WordPress admin pages and Kubernetes dashboards. And they compromised it. And it turns out on that machine were also some relatively privileged AWS credentials, which they found. Um, and then they used that to mine a bunch of Monero. And the truth is, like, these hackers might not have even known that they had pwned Tesla. They just saw that they had some machines and they could use it to mine crypto. So Tesla kind of dodged a bullet here. Uh, they didn't have any like, data breaches as a result of this. But still, like, this was a really close call for them. They probably had a really big AWS bill, but the damage was pretty much limited to that. And we want to make sure that we learn from these kinds of incidents and we can be prepared so that we don't fall down the same, the same uh, traps. <coughs> so. I could go through like a laundry list of like the, the top 10 things you should do in the current version of Kubernetes, but I didn't think that would be very useful. So I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach here. I'm going to spend some time trying to give you a little bit more evergreen perspective on it. We're going to talk about Kubernetes from the perspective of a security engineer. Then we're going to discuss the threat model, which is us thinking like an attacker and trying to figure out what kind of approach they would take to attack our systems, and hence what kind of approach we should take to defend against those events. And then I'm going to zoom in on a couple specific areas. 
There's a lot of different things I could cover, but I only have enough time to cover a couple. So I'm going to talk about my two favorite areas. One is secure software supply chain, which is a little bit more established area on container and Kubernetes security. And there's some really good tools out there now to make this, make this easy and effective. And then I'm going to talk about an area that I'm, I'm more interested in personally, um, closer to my personal area of research, which is runtime security, which is a, a newer area that's a little bit more, less established, but is something I think is very important also. So first, let's do another overview, because how many uh, Kubernetes overviews have you seen over the last couple of days? Probably quite a few. So it'll be another one. I'll try and keep it brief, and I'll try and shift the perspective a little bit to that of, of a security person. So one of the first things we notice when thinking about how our world has changed from a security perspective is how dynamic things are. Because previously, when we were installing our applications on bare metal or virtual machines, we might have a really sophisticated continuous delivery platform, but those things were essentially mutating static virtual machines and, and servers. And that was great and all. Like, we could get rapid deployments. But that's changed. That changes with containers. Containers give us the capability to shift things much faster. We can bring containers up, and we can bring them down in response to releases. We can bring them up and down in response to changes in traffic. It's not unusual for like a million containers to go up and down at some very large organizations today, just because it's, it's so low cost, and it is kind of core to what makes containerization so useful. So that's, that changes a lot about how an attacker would attack a system and how we have to defend. And some of that results from kind of the implementation details behind this stuff. Because if you go back to our old world, where we're probably running stuff on virtual machines, this is what the little tiny bubble diagram basically looks like. We have our applications and binaries um, and libraries kind of sitting on a guest operating system. And those might change, but the guest operating system stays pretty much the same. It's living in a VM, which is relatively thin, on top of a hypervisor that acts as a broker for all of those, all that communication with the host operating system. And those two operating systems might be very different. Whereas in a containerized world, we have stripped away some of that. And we have a much greater number of containers than we probably had virtual machines, because they're much lighter weight. And a couple of other things have changed. We've lost the hypervisor. And now we're essentially using features of the host operating system to do that sandboxing for us. And that means our guest operating system is gone entirely. And the applications and binaries and libraries are actually much closer to the underlying operating system and its kernel as well, which changes the way we have to think about things. So knowing those kind of two huge differences, we want to think how that's going to impact our, our, our vision as a security person. So like, how do we have to think about things differently? So let's weigh how those changes, you know, what are the pros and cons of those changes? From an attack surface perspective, attack surface being how much stuff we have to defend, how many things we have to keep track of as we come up with our defensive strategy, things have changed a lot. Virtual machines had the hypervisor boundary, which was a very strong security boundary. If you had a really serious compromise, they probably wouldn't be able to break out to the outside uh, kernel. So we've lost that. But on the flip side, we now have a we can have a, generally have a very small, thin host operating system. We have a host operating system that has much less software on it. It's not designed at all for us to log into and do interactive work. And that greatly reduces the amount of stuff we need to defend on our host operating system. So the attack service is a little bit of a wash. There's some pros and cons, probably overall a win. In terms of load isolation, because attacks aren't just about breaches, they're also about um, denying services by overwhelming uh, things. And host resources and virtual machines there was often a promise of getting good isolation between different VMs on the same host, but that didn't always work out. The noisy neighbor problem kind of persisted for many years. But in the containerized space, because they're implemented with like namespaces and C groups, we actually have pretty strong ways to isolate those containers from each other in terms of a resource consumption perspective. So generally a win on this side for containers. Root permissions, this one's another little bit of a wash. 
So virtual machines, there was a narrower set of system calls that were going to make it through the hypervisor that we needed to defend against, which means there were fewer opportunities for a malicious piece of software to, to pwn the entire machine. Containers, we have more system calls to, to watch out for because they're essentially making all the system calls the underlying layer. But on the flip side, we have much more sophisticated tools to do access control and control those shared resources. In lifetime, this one's one of the biggest things that changes the way you need to approach attacking and defending containerized stuff. Virtual machines had one benefit. If there's an event and you don't discover it for a week or a day or maybe, maybe a month, you can go back and dump the disk from that virtual machine and you'll probably be able to find some kinds of clues when you do your forensic analysis to figure out what went wrong so you can, you can fix it. In a containerized place, we have a much shorter lifespan, which means that by the time you know what happened, many of the containers that were involved might be gone and a lot of the evidence of what happened evaporated. But on the flip side, if someone compromises a container, their foothold is much smaller in lifespan. Because hacking's not quite like on TV. Sometimes attacks can take very, very long periods of time. And there's nothing more frustrating than losing, losing a foothold you have in an organization because a container died. So a lot, there's a lot of things that change between them. But when we think about the strategies we need to use and the approaches we need to take to solve these problems, a lot of the same tricks we used to have are going to work well. So now let's kind of break down the threats we have to deal with as a defender. This is kind of threat modeling. We think about the different places we have where things can break. And this is kind of the general way we approach a threat model from a defensive perspective at Google. We break it up into a few different areas. We could have broken it up based on like software architectural components or something like that, but we choose to break it up based on kind of where in the life cycle the work happens, which also happens to correspond with teams pretty often, which makes it easy to, you know, to get the support in from the, the other people doing the work. So one set of potential threats is around infrastructure. Like for example, what if there's a bug in Kubernetes API and someone's able to compromise it just by hitting, you know, taking advantage of a bug on the, the, the API uh, server itself? That would be really bad. Or what if they find a way to get a privilege escalation through Kubernetes and like take over the API server from a compromised container? And this is a bunch of, a bunch of threats. Fortunately, there's a lot of things we can do to, to deal with these that we know about already. Like, for example, updating your Kubernetes cluster. Like, keep things up to date. If you're running your own cluster, make sure you, you actually read the release notes and use the new security features as they come out. When our back is available, Use it. Upgrade to a version that allows it. Another way to help deal with this is use managed Kubernetes. So a lot of different cloud providers, if you're, using, if you're doing loads in the cloud, use uh, the managed Kubernetes provided by the cloud provider. And if there's a checkbox for auto upgrade, <laughs> check it. It is worth it. Another area is around software supply chain. So here, it's really focused on taking advantage of the strength we have from containerization. Because as it turns out, most of us have probably been deploying libraries with known vulnerabilities for a long time. And it's been hard to know that that happened. But now we can have insight into that. And I'm going to spend a little more time talking about this in a moment. And then finally, runtime. And this is the, the entire class of vulnerabilities that are harder to mitigate because they have to do with events that happen during the runtime itself. Like, it's hard to plan to make sure that you never experience a distributed denial of service attack. That's just something that you can plan for mitigation strategies to deal with it when it happens, but you can't do a lot of stuff to make yourself invulnerable to it. Or if you happen to be a high value enough target, somebody might burn a zero day on you and use a completely new vulnerability that's never been discovered before or never been published before on your stuff. And I'm going to spend some time talking about this too. So first, secure software supply chain. This is one of the things that's really cool that's come out of containerization. It's something that makes everything awesome. This is not an area that I spent a ton of time on research, though, so this part will be a little hand wavy, so I apologize. But I still think it's really important that you all get a piece of this and, and start using it. So time for another story. And I'm going to think back to some of the small companies I used to work at. So when we did releases, we had continuous integration, but this was in the days before continuous deployment was popular. So we did releases every week or every two weeks. And this is the kind of script we use to do deployments. 
which is pretty crazy. Someone, someone would have a Google Doc or something like that, and they would actually write up a list of steps that we did during the release. And then we'd have a rollback plan that was everything that you do if something goes wrong during that, so you can reverse it. And this was a huge step forward for us and our tiny companies at the time, because anyone, any software engineer or a person at the, at the organization could follow one of these scripts. We could do comments on them before it. And it gave us a lot of predictability and, and helped us a lot with our releases. But it had some really big gaps. Based on these scripts, it was impossible for us to know what specific versions of things are deployed on any server at any time. We really had no idea, because a lot of these steps were just like, update everything to the latest version, which doesn't tell you what's actually running on the machines. And later, we replaced these with chef recipes and things like that. And things were a little better, but we still had that same opaqueness, where we didn't know what was actually, we did not precisely know what was running in our production environment. And what would happen is vulnerabilities would come down the pipe. And some of them had really cool logos like this. These are all newer, but they, they would occasionally have awesome logos. And the news would come down, or you might subscribe to a feed of more fine-grained vulnerabilities. And we'd, when we encounter ones like these, we kind of panic and go around, and we check each one of our servers to see which one might be vulnerable. And we'd, we'd, have to, we'd have to come up with a new release plan to do our patching strategy. Or if it was an emergency, we would just patch it and then clean up the mess later. And it was always chaotic. But now we live in a better world. Because like, we have things like Docker files and things that give us a pretty relatively standardized definition of what's actually deployed. It wouldn't it be cool if we had these kind of standardized definitions of what's actually running in our system that's immutable and nice and stuff like that? Wouldn't it be cool if someone wrote software that automatically took those and built like a standardized API for metadata around that? And this is something that's well, it's becoming more established. And uh, it's available as part of Google's managed uh, container registry stuff. Um, but there's a lot of other options out there that are open source and provided from other people, too. And what it does, it takes the definitions for containers, and it, stand, like, it gives you a nice structured metadata way so that you can actually figure out what's running on your systems. And this is great, because at a glance, you can go look, see all the containers that you know are deployed, and then you can figure out all the versions that are running on them. And now that we have this, it's only one tiny step further to automatically take your database of metadata about your deploy containers and compare it with all the wonderful standardized databases we have of vulnerabilities now. And that's precisely the, the stuff that's coming together now. Uh, on Google Cloud Platform, it's in beta. But again, there's a whole bunch of open source solutions too and um, vendor solutions. So even if you're running on your own, Met your own Kubernetes cluster on your own metal, you can totally do this today. And I definitely encourage you to, because by having this, Whenever a new vulnerability comes out, all I have to do is scan all that metadata again, and I can see all the systems that are impacted by it or may have been exposed to issues in the past. And I can click through, and I can see these vulnerabilities. And I can decide, do I need to patch this right away? Are there's no patch available? Do I need to come up with a different mitigation for this? Might I be able to prevent this attack from happening by changing my software? Or maybe this vulnerability does not even apply to the application I'm running. But still, I have the insight. So as you containerize stuff, like, I definitely encourage you to get, get something like this set up just so you know the vulnerabilities you're exposed to. And I actually uploaded an intentionally vulnerable VM. I don't know if you can see, but there's 1,300 vulnerabilities in this particular VM. Uh, and this is not unusual. So if, you just, if you've been deploying containers for a while and you've never checked anything, and you have like fat operating systems or fat libraries and stuff on there, it's not unusual to have hundreds of vulnerabilities um, but don't panic, because what you can do right now is you can kind of work your way through this. And starting with the most critical ones, some of these might be resolvable just by patching things. But even if there's no known fix, there's pretty good mitigation you can do right away. Like, could you use a different base image, which is usually the magic solution to this problem? If you switch to like a really slim base, limit, base image that doesn't have, for example, in this one, I have tar and wget. I probably don't need tar and wget in, this, in most of my deployed stuff. So by getting rid of those things that I'm not using anyway, those vulnerabilities no longer affect me. So once you have this up, you can kind of chip away at the most critical vulnerabilities and at least know what you're exposed to. And then you can use this to integrate it back into your continuous integration and continuous delivery system. 
Just like for a lot of other security stuff, policies are a very powerful way to make sure that we stay in compliance with the things we want to do. And this is no different. So there, there are tools out there. This area is a little bit more, a little newer, and a little bit more rough. Um, ours, uh, the, the Google Cloud Platform one is also in beta. But you can establish policies that use external attestation servers that will like check those, 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 those vulnerability reports and be like, OK, we can deploy the vulnerabilities, but this is the whitelist of ones that don't have a fix that we know don't impact us for whatever reason. We can deploy those containers. But I would not recommend you dive into this until you've gotten those, those vulnerability lists down to a little bit smaller. So yeah, so now we have a system where at least we know what kind of vulnerabilities we have on our systems. So at least we, we know what, what our risks are. And hopefully, we've gotten that list very small, and we've, we've reduced our chances of exposure. So we prevented a lot of particular uh, incidents in the future. But we always want to make sure that we have, uh, we, we, we work towards, the, you know, we do defense in depth. So we make sure we have our bases covered. So we also want to make sure that we can detect bad things when they happen, regardless of why they happen. So the first question I get whenever I bring up this topic is like, why should I bother? I have all these cool new prevention techniques that I get almost at much lower cost through like supply chain security and that kind of stuff. Um, the truth is, you can't prevent everything. At some point, something is going to happen. Maybe you're a high value target and someone actually is using zero days on you. That would be a really bad time because like you're totally going to have to step up your security strategy because it's really hard to defend against that. But more often, what happens is somebody compromises, somebody gets access to some random GitHub account and compromises a library that impacts thousands of, of, of uh, different customers throughout the world. And this could be some tiny open source you know, library you're using in a Node.js thing that you, you know, no one really thinks about. That would be bad. You don't want to be one of the people impacted by that. Or more often, somebody makes a configuration error. It's the old fat finger thing where somebody makes a mistake on those policies and allows something through, or there's you know, downtime on the server and someone scrambles to fix it, and they accidentally expose you to a vulnerability that gets picked up by a bot. So this is an area where defense in depth, or the way I like to think of it, is fence post security. You don't want to spend all your time building one fence post in the middle of your field, like 100 meters high. Because yeah, sure, that one spot is really well protected from somebody passing through it. But they're just going to see that fence post and just walk around it to the other side. So if a hacker has figured out that you have like really good supply chain security, they're going to try and find some other way to get you if, if they want to. So rather than build one really tall fence post, it's better to build a lower fence but cover a, a wider breadth. So there's a lot of different software out there to handle this case. And essentially, this comes down to running monitoring software as part of your cluster. And there's some open source options. There are a lot of commercial um, software options out here for this. Um, but let's spend a little time talking about the design and how they accomplish runtime security. So essentially, it's software. It's a daemon somewhere that's running that hooks into your container. And it logs a bunch of stuff. But probably not logging like a lot of us think of. This is not application logging. Uh, this is much higher volume logging. And then based on those logs, it passes them through some policies, because security stuff always involves policies. And it'll either, based on events it sees in there, like it'll basically grep through them, and it'll either send you alerts that there's something you probably want to take a peek at, <laughs> or because we now have all these wonderful APIs for automatically managing our stuff, we can actually do automated remediation. So we can go in there, and we can programmatically change the state of our system right away. So faster than we would be able to respond to that page, we can have our software go in and automatically remediate a lot of problems. And also, like, as I said, containers go up and down. You've lost a lot of your forensic toolkit. So using runtime security software might be your only way to find out what happened after the event. So around detection, I mentioned that like, this is logs at a different level than we're probably used to. This is really, really high volume logs, because we're going to need a lot of detail if we're going to want to be able to do that forensic work later. I'm talking like. P trace, K probes type level, like really, really high, like, like logging a, a large subset of the system calls that are happening beneath your container, that kind of level. 
And there are different ways this can be implemented. If you have a relatively up-to-date Linux kernel, you can use eVPF, um, which is a, a technology for kind of hooking in and seeing events that are happening in an efficient way. Um, XDP is also something that's, that's, that's newer uh, and allows you to use the, the eBPF filters to look at network traffic, which can be another very useful thing uh, to understand what's happening. And some of them also use user mode APIs uh, to look for different kernel events that are coming back that are getting triggered by like iNotify or something. But you don't really need to understand the details. It's just there is not really a best way to do this yet. Each one of these options has different trade-offs. There might be a higher performance cost in some cases, but you'll get higher resolution of information. And so everybody's kind of using different approaches to get this information right now. <laughs> and along with those different approaches, they have slight different mix of different deployment models. Um, but essentially, it all starts with a really, really simple Kubernetes cluster with a single pod running on a single node, a single container in it. And if you want to do runtime monitoring on it, runtime security, you're going to have some kind of management container running, usually on each node, that does all of the, all of the heavy lifting. And then you need some way to, to have privileged access to monitor. So a lot of implementations use a kernel extension, a kernel module that runs on the node itself. This is great. It can be very efficient. But it is often not compatible with managed Kubernetes if you're having a cloud provider run it for you. So a lot of them use a privileged container that runs in each one of your pods that actually do work. And either way, it's going to be reporting that information back to the management container. And then you have a huge volume of events that are coming out, which you're probably going to want to throttle a little bit based on, on the circumstances. Um, you're going to be writing it to like a local database or a persistent disk somewhere or off to a third-party cloud database. Um, but there's one clever thing I've seen some implementers use, is they keep a ring buffer on each node so that when an event happens, because they might only be sending a tiny subset of the logs off in the normal state. But when they detect an event, they can take that ring buffer, which is super efficient, and just dump it out to external storage to give everyone a peek into what happened in a high resolution over the previous 10 or 20 seconds which can be really useful for, for, uh, for forensics. OK, so now that we have software that's been able to detect that's happened, how do we respond? This is where it starts to get interesting. So the first thing you'll want to do, usually the default configuration, just send an alert for everything. And that, that's good if there's any one of those things that might, you know, things that are a little suspicious. It's like, huh, someone seems to be mining crypto. I wonder if that's actually a compromise or just somebody's bored. But automatic remediation is where it gets interesting. So if there's an event that you've, you're pretty sure someone no one should be mining cryptocurrency, um, you might want to isolate that container and take it and separate it out into a separate network, which is really cool because you're keeping the attacker busy. If you actually have a human attacker that's attacking you at that point in time, they may not know what's going on. So you may be able to isolate them from everything else in your cluster without them knowing they've been shut out, which will, will buy you time and give you a chance to do kind of live forensics. You can actually, if they're still connected, you can get a lot of cool information out of that. And if the situation is more serious, you might want to pause, or restart, or, or kill the container even. So like if you have an event that's spreading throughout your cluster, you might want to have your software automatically start killing containers you know that are having significant events, which is a good way to, to shut that stuff down quickly. But at that point, you might be impacting your service. So this sounds a lot like a normal IDS. What's different? Why do we have to do something that's container specific? That's because it goes back to that, that beginning of the conversation. Some of these things are just, we just have to do. So like, for example, if we have an intrusion detection system, an IDS that's like per host, it's like an application installed on each host, or a network appliance is sitting there uh, on our network looking for these kinds of events. It was great in the previous world because we had those long-lived VMs. And if it sees an event and correlates it to an IP address on our physical network, that might have been useful data before. But when you have thousands of containers bouncing around and going up and down, that IP address and that specific physical host might not be useful information at all. So whatever you use for this, it has to understand both the overlay network and like the inner workings of the containers to some extent. We get a lot more value out of it, understanding that information. 
And fortunately, a lot of the managed cloud providers, like, like the Google Kubernetes engine, um, already has integration with a whole bunch of people writing software in this space. Uh, this includes some open source options as well as a bunch of commercial options uh, because a lot of the security space has a lot of commercial software compared to when I used to live in software development land. I could open source everything. So yeah, just, just definitely if you're using a managed Kubernetes solution, look and see what existing integrations they have. Um, there might be something that will fit your needs without having to do much work. Just use one of these turnkey integrations. So with that, let's, let's see this actually happen in action. Why not? So I'm going to do a demo of one of these runtime security things doing stuff. So our story starts with a Kubernetes cluster. Let me make that a little bigger. I made everything bigger. I'm sure we'll be fine. Let me clear some stuff out, make this a little bigger. So I'm just going to show you a simple Kubernetes cluster that I have deployed. And we're just going to take a quick look around first. And we can see that this, let's just say this is a Kubernetes cluster we set up for a marketing team for some reason. They wanted to run some experiments, and we decided to give them the keys to a Kubernetes cluster, which is probably a terrifying idea. But it worked out in this case, because they actually deployed some stuff to it, surprisingly. Uh, it looks like they have one thing set up right now. They have a WordPress blog, which is cool. They followed all of our organizational rules. They deployed the newest version of WordPress. It doesn't look like they have a domain name set up yet or any TLS, but they deployed an image that was up to date and met our criteria for vulnerabilities. And this is a fully up-to-date WordPress, and everything is great. But this is one of those cases where it's not necessarily a zero day that gets dropped on us, but bad things can happen. Because WordPress, by default, by design, we'll say, has some, some issues. For example, if you have a user who deployed it and they did not use the strongest password available to them, this might get discovered by some random bot surfing around. I mean, how many times have you seen slash WP admin and like random HTTP logs? There's a lot of bots out there just looking for WordPress dashboards. And the reason is because if you go to WordPress and you go to the theme editor, <laughs> has an interesting feature in that this one's just CSS, but if you look around here, we see actual PHP code in here. By design in WordPress, just by the nature of it existing, anyone with admin access can put code that runs on your system. And code execution is pretty much you know, the, end, the end of it for, for a lot of situations. Because like, for example, what they can do in this case is grab this one line of PHP that doesn't look that scary, at least not to somebody not in the know. And they can save this template. And they can log out, and no one will, uh, will be the wiser, because like this WordPress blog still works. It still looks fine. It's not slower. I can still go to the blog posts. Even the search, which is what I modified, still seems to work fine. But what's actually happening in the background is our attacker, who just made one little stop at that WordPress blog, might have a different server sitting somewhere else. And they might have a virtual machine running on it with that IP address and that one line of PHP I put up there. And all they have to do is run a tiny little process with netcat. In this case, I'm just going to listen on port 1234. And now, all it takes is somebody, the attacker, or maybe some random drive-by person, to, to hit a search, just do a search query, any query. And sure enough, we have a shell on that container. And this is something that just happens that easily. And although this container is relatively well secured, like this is a fully up-to-date Kubernetes, so I'm not going to be able to get any super privileged keys. And like it's relatively well locked down. I still have code execution and a shell on this system, which, is, which can be a bummer. Because I can look around. I can. Who am I? Oh, I'm dub 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 data. Can I pseudo things? No, there's no pseudo. Uh, but so it looks like I probably won't be able to do a ton of damage. Like if I try and touch a file on slash sys, no, that's not working. But I can still curl things. Go grab something from my random website. 
like a binary that mines cryptocurrency. If I can write chmod right. And it didn't work in this case, because this machine doesn't have any GPUs on it, and this is a GPU miner. But at this point, I could go grab like a Monero miner and do some CPU mining. And it's quite possible that nobody would notice this problem for quite a while. But it's OK, because we did some stuff ahead of time. Let me show you something in Kubernetes cluster. So I went ahead and, because I knew marketing might do foolish things, I installed some runtime security stuff on my cluster. In this case, I went and got one of the open source options, uh, Sysdig Falco. I used it because it was the one I could get running in about 10 minutes. And I left all of the settings on default. And it can already detect these kinds of problems. So I made my little handy dandy dashboard so I can see security events happen. And the moment this shell gets created, boop. I see this message come down the pipe, which would probably go to whatever my intrusion dashboard is, or in this case, a little web app I hacked up. And it tells me important information that a debug shell was spawned, which is not necessarily a terrible thing. This is kind of like a yellow flag. But uh, it, was, it was the parent process is Apache. <laughs> and it goes to some random IP address I don't know. And it's owned by data user. data should never be creating a shell. So in this case, I just got an alert, but I might want to do automatic remediation based on this event. I might probably want to shut down that container or something. And this is just with the default setting. So I was able to detect that and know that my marketing team got pwned before things got really bad. And that was actually pretty easy to set up. It only took about 10 minutes to set that up. And that's all on, on Google Kubernetes Engine. But it would work just as well on other Kubernetes deployments. So that was the demo. We dodged a bullet. Something bad happened. They mined some crypto, but we made it out OK. We got the notice. We called them up, and we're like, hey, something's wrong. I'm turning off your blog. And no one was too sad. So I talked about a couple different general things. This is just kind of a, a tiny bite of all the different things you want to pay attention to with Kubernetes security. But I want to leave you with, with what you can do today. So, if, you, if you're leaving now and, or leaving at the end of the day and you're about to apply a bunch of cool stuff, you're about to move a bunch of new things, containerize some existing workloads, use the full power of Kubernetes, or if you have established stuff, write a security plan either way. And when you start to work on that plan, figure out how much resources you have, how much time and how much money and how much engineering time you have to solve your problems. And don't put them all on the one area you think is really cool. Don't focus just on supply chain security. Try and spread those resources out across multiple areas. Because we want to have defense in depth. We want to have some kind of redundancy. We want to know that we can handle all the different threats that we're exposed to with at least one or hopefully multiple measures. And the cool thing about Kubernetes is because it's relatively standardized, like people are using similar container images, we actually have a lot more open source software in this space than we've had in the past for, for these kinds of um, intrusion detection systems and, and stuff like that. So try out the open source options. Some of them are a little young. And if they don't work out, uh, maybe work with the existing vendor you have for security software if you have one. They might have container aware options or stuff that'll solve these problems. Otherwise, I hate to say it, but it's probably worth talking to some vendors. The other thing is, no matter what plan you come up with, deploy it early. This is a case where you know, a gram of prevention is definitely going to be worth a kilogram of cure. And the reason you want to deploy early is because you want to get baseline readings. Like, for example, I don't know if any of you noticed, but my little tiny dashboard was kind of flipping out there for a moment at the beginning. And that's because there were real events triggering the default Sysdig Falco rules. Uh, there were real events that I knew were safe that were coming from Google, Google Kubernetes Engine. So I want to have a baseline reading so I know to write more fine-grained rules that ignore those events because I know that they're safe, even though like, it was trying to write. It was doing a read event on, like, on a root partition. So I want to make sure that I tune those signals down uh, so that I'm getting a good quality of signal to noise in the case when things are going right. And once you have all that working, rehearse an event. This is something we love doing at Google. We do this thing called DIRT, where we'll like turn off parts of a data center sometimes, just to make sure that our recovery systems work. Do that. If 
if you have like a hack week, get some people and have them really hack for that hat week. And while they're doing that, see what kinds of events they're being able to do. See if they're able to get into something. And if they are able to get into something, see that you can detect it. Or maybe do some experimentation with the insider threat and have someone within rules of engagement see if they can find, you know, get access to data they shouldn't and see if your security systems detect those as well. Uh, or if you have like government-mandated pen tests, which a lot of people groan about having to do, normally you just get a big pen test report, penetration test report, you throw it on your desk, and no one would ever look at it again. This is another great opportunity to actually watch your security software to see if it can detect uh, success or even failure in that penetration test. So with that, hopefully you have a plan now. Don't just run and deploy a bunch of stuff to containers. Well, do that, but, but don't put it in production yet until you have a little bit of security planning. So thank you very much. I hope this wasn't too scary. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>